I'm Janice Stein, the chair of the Lionel Gelber Prize, uh, which is awarded in partnership with the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, we are here to talk with the authors of one of our shortlisted books, Trade Wars Are Class Wars by Matthew Klein and Michael Pettis, an absolutely riveting analysis of the distortions in the global economy and what they mean for all of us. I'm here with Matthew Klein in the United States and Michael Pettis in China to talk about their brilliant book, Trade Wars Are Class Wars, How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace. Uh, good morning early to you, Matthew, and good evening to you, Michael. Michael, let me start with you. Uh, I love this book. It is such a counterintuitive interpretation of trade and of globalization. What made you write this book, and what do you think are the most controversial ideas in it? Well, uh, Janice, I think our, our, our basic argument is that um, in the last perhaps 40, 50 years, there's been such a significant change in both um, uh, uh, trade and in capital flows. The world has changed very, very dramatically, but our models of understanding trade haven't, and so they've become obsolete. Rather than focus on, uh, on bilateral trade accounts and, and, and on uh, uh, production, cost differentials, what we argue is that what really drives trade and above all trade imbalances are income imbalances. Uh, and these lead directly to savings imbalances, which are transmitted globally through the capital account. So I would say the most important point we try to make in this book is that we need to change the way we think about trade and to focus on primarily the savings imbalances. And, and and I guess the additional point that we make is that uh, uh, trade is really not a conflict between countries. Because it depends on income imbalances, it's really a conflict between economic sectors or, or, or classes, as we put it in the title. That, you know, those arguments came through uh, loud and clearly in the book, Michael. Uh, and I, when I finished uh, the book, uh, I left with a sense of what we face um, are differences or asymmetries in domestic savings, uh, partly as a result of government policies in different countries. Would that be fair? Yes. And, you know, when, when, uh, when Matthew and I uh, were interviewed by Adam Tooze, one of the points that he made, he said the most counterintuitive point for him was our argument, and I think it's, it's pretty well established, that uh, the U.S. savings rate is not and cannot be determined domestically. The U.S. savings rate reflects uh, two things, U.S. investment and net capital inflows into the U.S., about which it has almost no control. And I think that surprised a lot of people because we, we're used to saying the U.S. runs a trade deficit because Americans don't save. And what we show is that it's impossible for Americans to save as long as you have these massive net or, or to save enough, as long as you have these massive net inflows. That's simply not how the balance of payments works. And I think when Matthew, when Matthew talks about Germany, I think we'll see a very clear example of, of how that works. You know, that is one of the most striking arguments uh, in the book, because we do tend to think about savings as a domestic issue. Uh, and I'm um, going to you, Matthew. Germ your, the analysis of Germany breaks every stereotype <laughs> that we have uh, 
uh, certainly in Canada of the German economy, uh, virtuous German savers uh, who, frankly, virtue signal to their poorer cousins in the European Union. Now, your, your chapter on Germany just takes that one on head on. Why is that conventional picture so wrong? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. It's a really fascinating story, and it illustrates a lot of the, the points we make in the book, which is that you know, the, the Euro crisis and the, you know, the conflicts that we've seen there are often portrayed as being about national character, about you know, the, virtu you know, the, the, the spendthrift South and the austere North. And that's not really right at all, that actually, if we look you know, what actually happened in these countries, most, most importantly, Germany, that it's really about working class and, and ordinary Germans, retirees versus um, elite Germans, wealth, you know, the wealthy uh, business owners who control a lot of the family businesses and so forth. And, you know, one of the things that's really interesting, and it's a common misconception, you know, in the United States and Germany and in Canada elsewhere, is that the reason why Germany has had such a large trade surplus over the past 20 years is because German businesses are so much more productive, that exports are so good quality. And that doesn't actually explain anything. I mean, it's not that German exports aren't good. I mean, I have a meal vacuum and it works works great. But the, the problem is that um, imports have been weak. So the, the way that things are supposed to work is that if you're capable, if your society is capable of producing really high quality goods for export, your reward should be that you get to enjoy more imports. So to think about the German example, if they can sell, you know, very high quality vacuum cleaners or, or cars or whatever, then German workers should be able to go on more vacations or enjoy better food or things like that. And, and yet that's not what's happened. And I think one of the most striking you know, ways of demonstrating this is that the growth rate of German exports since 2000 has actually been very slow compared to uh, before 2000, even though this is the period when Germany's trade surplus widens and then, you know, remains very large. The only reason the trade surplus exists is because import growth was even slower. And that's a function of the fact that German households and German businesses and the German government have all been spending less than they otherwise would have been. Um, some of that is due to a redistribution, a deliberate redistribution by German businesses, essentially squeezing their own workers and, and boosting their own profit margins. Some of that is due to government policies that have sort of, for ideological reasons, been focused on um, cutting uh, welfare spending and raising taxes in order to reduce the budget deficit. Some of that's due to business caution after the tech bust of the 1990s. But all these forces have combined to the fact that German society as a whole has been living below its means. We've had a shift in the distribution of income away from people who would actually like to buy goods and services. And it's that squeeze that's led to you know, weakness in imports and uh, sustained trade imbalance. The flip side of this, um, because, you know, just to, because you know, we're in a global system, this can't happen in isolation. The flip side of this is that there's been necessarily someone else in the rest of the world has been borrowing and spending more than they've otherwise been producing. That, that's this is a necessary corollary. And you know, before 2008, it was people in the rest of Europe, Germany's neighbors. And then after that, it's been you know, a variety of other places, including the United States and elsewhere. And, and um, you know, that's sort of the, the flip side. And German, the German financial system has been facilitating this by essentially investing this, uh, the excess earnings of rich Germans into often very low yielding enterprises, whether it's, uh, you know, green cell capital recently having the, you know, issues often, it turns out it's like German banks that were among, you know, key involved in that, or, you know, more in the further in the past was US subprime or, German, or Greek government bonds. And then this is, you know, again, it's not really good for anyone, either in Germany or elsewhere. You know, it's your data and your evidence uh, really support the argument in the book uh, that you just made. How much of this, so you and you trace it partly to German financial institutions, less so a little, I think, to German policy, government policy. How much of this do you think, Matthew, might be the culture uh, in Germany, which more than any other country was so traumatized uh, by runaway inflation and has built in um, a kind of prudence uh, that doesn't really exist anywhere in Europe. When you look at the, the German central bank, for instance, it behaves differently than other central banks. And many, many people who write about the German economy attribute that to the, the legacy of history, the heavy weight of history that Germans remember in a very vivid way. That's an interesting question. And I mean, it's tricky because, you know, a couple points. One is that the German household savings rate is actually not particularly high compared to the rest of Europe. I mean, Italian households actually are more, uh, you know, 
prudent as savers. The, the reason that the German economy generally, you know, as a whole, has a higher savings rate has been because German businesses have been relatively investing less and having higher profit margins, and because the German government has been more focused on, you know, having narrow budget deficits. And even then, the, the budget position of German government versus, say, the Italian government is largely a function of the fact that interest rates in Germany have been lower, and there's less of an interest burden on their debt. The other point I would say is that while it's true that you know, within Germany that has a lot of political salience, the memory of the hyperinflation of the 1920s, that the deflation of you know, the late 1920s, early 1930s, probably was actually the thing that more directly led to the, uh, you know, the banking collapse and so forth and, and Bruning's austerity that directly led to the rise of, of the Nazis. So even then that's sort of a, you know, the choice of history is a little, um, you know, selective there. So I don't, yeah, I, I think that it's, there, there are other, and of course, I guess the other thing I would say is German culture did not change radically in the early 2000s compared to before. And this phenomenon, um, the, the trade surplus, the magnitude of the trade surplus in Germany um, really is a post-2000 phenomenon. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right that, the, you know, German culture cannot explain uh, that divide that occurs after 2000. Your, your argument about deflation is one that Adam Tooze, who, by the way, is a Lionel Galbraith Prize winner <laughs> for his book, Crashed, um, he makes that argument uh, as well. Um, Michael, let, let's come to China. Uh, there is no more uh, central issue right now um, in the United States than strategy toward China. And you can make a compelling argument uh, you and Matthew, of a very similar story um, of uh, workers that are squeezed in order to generate resources for investment and what you call the misallocation of investment uh, by the Chinese government as a result of this strategy. Tell us a little about that. Sure. Let me let me start out uh, um, by addressing the cultural argument too, because we heard that a lot in China, and you know my, my background I think is a little bit different than others. Uh, uh, my dad's American and my mom's French. I was born in Spain. I grew up in Pakistan, Peru, Spain. Live in China, and so it may seem surprising, but I tend to be much more skeptical than most other people about the whole cultural argument. And you'll remember ten or fifteen years ago. There was a very strong argument about the, the high savings rate in China. It has to do with culture, Confucian culture. As we all know, Confucian cultures save a lot of money and work very hard. And I found that pretty funny because in the 1950s and 60s, when economists were trying to explain why East Asian countries were so desperately poor, they also used the cultural argument. These countries are Confucian, and as we all know, Confucian countries don't value hard work or thriftiness. So, you know, it sort of explains whatever you wanted to explain. In the case of China, which has the highest savings rate in the world, we know exactly why China has the highest savings rate in the world. And that is because household income in the 1980s was roughly 70 something percent of GDP, which is in line with many other countries. And China had a fairly low savings rate. But their development model, which I call the Gershenkron model, they didn't invent it, quite a number of countries followed it, involved pushing up the savings rate by transferring income away from consumers who are ordinary people and giving it to low consumers who are the rich businesses and the government. So what happened is the household share of income dropped to around 50% which is perhaps the lowest for any country we've ever seen. And even within that, the rich have a disproportionate share. And the rich don't consume their income. Businesses don't consume their income. Governments consume very little. So if you take away income from ordinary Chinese, which is what happened, and pass it on to the rest of the economy, the consumption share collapses. And the saving share becomes, as in the case of China, the highest in history. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the correct answer in economics should always be, it depends. In the 1980s and 90s, when China had gone through five decades of anti-Japanese war, civil war, and Maoism, it was hugely underinvested for its level of social development. 
So what they needed was to invest in everything, roads, bridges, airports, uh, 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 railroads, subways. They had no subways in China back then, um, um, uh, uh, factories, et cetera, et cetera. So by forcing up the domestic savings rate and not allowing the money to leave China, it poured into investment projects. And that was very good for China. It grew very, very rapidly. And even though households, in a sense, were getting screwed, they still did well. GDP grew at 10%, household income grew at 7%. That's great. The problem that this growth model has always run into is that at some point you max out your ability to absorb additional infrastructure, additional investment productively. And then when you do that, you need to change your growth model. But as Albert Hirschman explained way back in the 1970s, it's politically very difficult to change that growth model. And China has been talking about doing this since at least 2007, and it hasn't been able to. So as a result, the engine of Chinese growth is continued investment in non-productive real estate and, uh, and, and uh, uh, infrastructure, which means by definition, debt should start growing faster than GDP. And I don't need to tell you, among other superlatives of China, it has had the fastest growing debt perhaps in history, the fastest growing debt burden. And this is all part of the same growth model, which is why the Chinese, why Beijing talks about rebalancing income. But as Hirschman warned, it's easy to talk about that. It's politically very difficult to do that. It really is very hard to do, um, Michael. And in the book, um, you, t you provide a, a really compelling portrait of the four different periods of Chinese growth uh, since Deng Xiaoping. But when we come to the present model, uh, Xi Jinping is talking about, about increasing domestic consumption. Uh, this is not a new refrain from a Chinese leader. But what your book shows is, in fact, that they are now exporting uh, their investment surplus rather than growing domestic consumption. And they're doing it through the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, in the title of your book, uh, you said threatens international peace. Uh, is that the link you're drawing? Not so much through Belt and Road. You know, if, if China exported its, uh, its savings surplus to developing countries, that would be a good thing because developing countries actually need the savings. The U.S. and Europe have way too much ex-ante savings. I mean, our problem is demand, not more savings. Um, but the problem with exporting it to developing countries is the problem that we've all learned, which is it's quite easy to export capital. It's quite hard to get it back. And as a result, BRI has turned out to be an important geopolitical uh, uh, initiative of the Chinese government. But I think they ever since, you know, probably the problems in Venezuela around 2014, 2015, They've gotten very uh, sour on it, and they're trying to and are reducing the amount of capital they're exporting. So what that means is that they have to they have to um, uh, 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 rebalance their current account surplus. Their trade surplus is now monthly trade surplus of some of the biggest they've ever had in their history. They have to rebalance it not by exporting the capital to developing countries, but by exporting it to the U.S. and to Europe. Who don't need it. And that's really the problem. And that's why we say, you know, threaten international peace may be a little bit of, a, of, a, of an exaggeration, but historically, these periods of reversal of globalization have always come with increased geopolitical tension, you know, more anti-immigrant feeling, blaming foreigners for your problems, and sometimes to a shooting war. I, I don't think it'll come to that. But all those other things we've already come to. You know, that takes us right to the United States. Uh, and again, we have um, a very counterintuitive picture, Matthew, of the United States, the sinkhole, as you described it, um, of capital flows that come in, distort the U.S. economy, uh, hurt uh, 
uh, the groups uh, who are least able to afford it and actually constrain government policy. Where are we now as the Biden administration attempts to figure out its strategy? That's a big question. So I guess just to sort of back up and explain, you know, why this is the case. The, the, the basic issue is that the United States financial system is essentially serves the world as a whole. But the U.S. economy is much smaller than the world economy. And so to the extent that the U.S. financial system is accommodating the needs of people globally, um, and those needs don't match up with what people in the U.S. need, you're going to have these mismatches and imbalances, and that can prove to be very damaging. So, for example, if you look at, say, the, the 2000s, you have a period where globally um, savers, both in the U.S. and the rest of the world, have a real strong desire for holding um, what they think are safe bonds. But there's only so much that can be sort of produced you know, naturally or safely or what have you. And so, you know, when that happens, you know, the people in, in Wall Street and the banking system, they, they are, you know, flexible or creative, whatever word you want to use. And um, they are able to generate more bonds in order to match global demand. But they do that by essentially creating, um, you know, trillions of dollars of, of toxic mortgage securities that end up, you know, going bust and fueling the housing debt bubble. So that is an example of how, an external impetus for, you know, holding some kind of U.S. asset can distort the U.S. economy in a way that's not productive for Americans. And there are other ways we talk about the book. In the context of what's going on with, with right now, the Biden administration, this is something I've been actually doing in my, in my day job at, at, at Barron's is looking at, is the extent to which the U.S. government has been much more proactive than governments in the rest of the world at sustaining consumer spending during the pandemic has led to a very large and widening imbalance in trade with the US and the rest of the world. So the trade deficit in the US has been expanding very rapidly. This isn't actually because US imports are surging. It's really imports have basically gone back to about to where they were before the pandemic. But that because people, governments in the rest of the world have not been responding commensurately, that exports are still relatively weak. And so if you look at the latest data, which are from January, it's basically US imports as a whole are something like about where they were you know, a year ago, exports are down about 9%. And so, and that obviously leads to a you know, relatively large imbalance. That's the flip side, by the way, of when Michael was talking about the Chinese trade surplus. It's, it's basically a perfect mirror image, which interestingly does not show up in the trade data of the US and China directly with each other, um, which goes to show why you should look at those data to understand these things. But it is, in fact, you know, how these things add up uh, one way or another. That's, that's what's going on. And so you know, the challenge for the Biden administration is essentially there's a trade-off between being you know, more debt versus you know a weaker uh, domestic economy versus you know as long as you have an open trading system and so right now the choice they've made which you know I think relative to those options is the right choice to make but the choice is um, the government is taking on a lot more debt uh, in order to ensure that U.S. households are you know have sufficient income to meet their you know meet their needs and this is coming at the cost of you know significant widening the trade imbalance. The alternatives are all, all are all worse, but it is sort of a general reflection of, of the problem, and it, you know that's that's essentially the situation that the, the world in the U.S. is in. You know, if we can take your argument up a level, um, uh, you could argue that the Biden administration, along with others, are seeking to support uh, demand and seeking to increase domestic consumption, which is actually something that you and Michael argue for in your book. Uh, but is that enough, or are you, do you go further when you look out at the next year or two and say what we have to do is have far less trade? We have to have far more closed economies than we've had during this heyday of globalization. I don't think closing economies of trade in itself would be particularly valuable. I mean, the problem <clears throat> that we've seen with globalization isn't globalization per se. It's the fact that it, you know, the way it's been executed has been done in such a way that it discourages um, domestic consumption, in particular, discourages paying workers the value of what they produce. The globalization, as it's been practiced, has been predicated on the idea that companies try to find the places with the least labor protections, the least environmental protections, and then move production there and, you know, sort of exploit that difference between places that, you know, have, have different standards. And that obviously naturally leads to resentment and also turns out to be bad for the global economy insofar as it exacerbates a problem that had already existed, which was insufficient demand relative to, you know, the world's economy to make goods and services. And so that's the problem. It's not globalization per se. So if you cut yourself off or try to, that doesn't fix it. Let's push you just a wee bit further then. Uh, you know, the answer might be then in part 
onshoring or reshoring. But we know how hard that is to do, frankly, to reduce the capacities of big companies uh, to take advantage of the most favorable environment and then to use just in time global supply chains. If there were onshoring and reshoring, some of that would go away and workers would benefit. But that's been tried and we know how hard that is to do. So how do you break through? this Gordian knot that you and Michael have talked about? That's a good question. I mean, I, I, onshoring certainly could be an option. I mean, you know, the, what we talk about in the book a lot is quite frankly, like it would be better for everyone, both people in China and the United States, if in China, living standards rose and policies that, you know, the, the party elite and the government have, have agreed on, <clears throat> often in, you know, in collusion with, with Western business interests to suppress the wages of workers and living standards there, if those policies were changed, that would be good for people in China, that'd be good for people globally. So <clears throat> moving production out of China would not necessarily, I mean, maybe that would help in some ways, but that wouldn't really solve sort of underlying problems. Same thing with, you know, looking at the situation in Europe, for example. So, but that does lead to the general question of how you make these things happen. And, and you know, quite frankly, that's a real challenge, um, you know, and it's not, you know, that, that's sort of in some ways a very different, you know, book to be writing than it's sort of analyzing the problem and, ex and explaining it. So it's a, it's tricky. I mean, the, 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 we've, in general, what we've seen in the past is that periods where you have these big imbalances do end up ending one way or another. Often it ends up being in a sort of a destructive way. Uh, but, you know, it, that doesn't mean that constructive solutions are impossible. It's just that, you know, these things haven't generally tended to happen, but, you know, We'll see, I guess. Matthew and uh, Michael have written, I think, a groundbreaking book uh, for all of us who are interested uh, in the global economy, but far more, uh, because your book uh, deals with domestic inequality, which is not domestically driven. Um, I think you're right that the challenges um, are huge in terms of getting these adjustments. There has been such a long conversation uh, with China's government about increasing domestic consumption, uh, and yet your book shows how hard that's going to be for China. So I think your next book, the two of you, is to take on this challenge exactly and uh, really start to unravel these connections, which have served to distort but it, the book is also so important because it's a warning uh, that the way the global economy is functioning now is not sustainable over time, that the imbalances are not sustainable. And as you just put it, Matthew, they always end one way or the other, and often not well. Uh, I want to thank you both. Um, this is a remarkable book, an absolutely remarkable book by Matthew Klein and Michael Pettis. Trade wars are class wars. It, it should be uh, for all our listeners and viewers on your must read agenda uh, for this year. Uh, and it's just been a, a pleasure talking to the two of you.